I'm Arthur Herbst. Uh, we're here in April of 2011 to mark the 40th anniversary of the publication of the original paper linking mother's ingestion of diethylstilbestrol with the very rare development of clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina in their daughters and to discuss that and all the other things we have found out about this phenomenon over the years. Uh, I'm Anthony Montag. Um, I'm from the Department of Pathology at the University of Chicago. Dr. Herbst actually hired me 25 years ago, and uh, I'll be interviewing him for uh, the historical record in the DES paper. What was your role at the Massachusetts General Hospital at the time that the DES connection was discovered? I had trained at the Mass General and at what was then the Boston Lying In and Free Hospital and went on the staff of the Mass General as a gynecologist uh, in 1965. Uh, over the next few years, a few young women came to the hospital who were patients of my chief, Howard Ulfelder, uh, and some staff members, Frank Ingersoll and Tom Green. These young women were in their late teens and early 20s and had an extraordinarily rare tumor called clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Uh, while that disease had been described in older women, uh, none of us had heard of it in young people. And Dr. Robert Scully, the gynecologic pathologist of the Mass General, and I got together seven cases of clear cell adenocarcinoma and described their clinical and pathologic characteristics and this was published in the journal Cancer in 1970. After that, um, there were some interviews with mothers, one of whom brought her daughter back for follow-up and mentioned to my chief Howard Allfelder that she took this drug during pregnancy, diethylstilbestrol, and wondered if that had anything to do with it. I also was following a mother whose daughter unfortunately died of the disease because it had never been diagnosed properly. And I remember talking to her and she mentioned the same thing. We therefore decided with the collaboration of uh, David Postkanzer, who was a uh, epidemiologist and pediatric neurologist at the Mass General, whom I knew from medical school, and also consulted with Ted Colton, who was a statistician uh, at uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, to design a study. And what we did is we, by that time, knew of an eighth case that would, had been treated elsewhere in Boston, it was the same as R7, and we decided to get four controls, or exactly the same as our uh, cancer cases, but uh, hopefully could serve as controls to test whether it was DES or anything else that did it. We went back to the hospitals where these young ladies were born. They were all born in New England and we got the females who were born in the same hospital as close as we could in time. I then got on the phone and called these various mothers to see if they would be willing to participate in our study. And most of them, interestingly enough, said yes, they were willing to do it and to talk to uh, one of our uh, research young ladies who would go around and see them. I did get a phone call one night at home from an irate husband who wanted to know what I wanted with his wife, and I explained to him I really didn't want anything with her, but we decided she probably shouldn't participate in the study. But we did get 32 women uh, with female daughters who were our controls in the eight cases, and what we found out was that seven, not all, but seven of the eight mothers uh, of the daughters with cancer took DES for either bleeding or prior miscarriage, None of the 32 controls did. Uh, interestingly, 21 of the 32 mothers, if I remember the data correctly, smoked, and seven of the eight mothers also smoked, but those were not statistically significantly different. So the big thing was prior bleeding, uh, or bleeding during pregnancy, or prior miscarriage uh, led to the giving of DES, and that was associated with the development of this cancer many years later. What was the logic of administering DES to women during pregnancy for bleeding? One of the problems that existed uh, in the late 40s and early 50s is recurrent miscarriage and pregnancy loss. 
We know today that's caused mostly by genetic reasons, chromosomal abnormalities, but in those days we didn't know that. There were some data that suggested that during pregnancy there was a faulty endocrine environment, specifically the output of progesterone measured in the urine as pregnane dialglucuronide was decreased in abnormal pregnancies. And there were some tests done that suggested that if you gave diethyl stilbestrol, that it would increase the output of pregnane dialglucuronide in the urine, at least as it was measured in those days, which was a very crude measurement. Turned out the measurement was erroneous, but nobody knew it at that time. So that was the basis for giving this compound to try to get the endocrine environment of the pregnancy normal. In the 1970s, women were still given DES, and in fact, after our paper was published, there were still a number of people who felt it should be given, that it was helpful to their infertility patients to maintain a so-called precious pregnancy, so it was continued to be given. Approximately six months after our paper was published, the FDA did put out a notice contraindicating the use of these drugs during pregnancy. How difficult was it to find the uh, pharmacy records for the administration of the DES? Uh, pharmacy records were almost non-existent. Uh, we were fortunate in some cases to get the doctor's records. In a number of cases, we were dependent on the mother's memory, which obviously was not as reliable as a written record. So we categorized the various cases depending upon the strength of the evidence for administration of DES. So how surprised were you to find a cluster of cases, uh, young women with the same disease? Well, it was very surprising and it was very unusual. In fact, I think it's fair to say if I hadn't been in Boston or somebody hadn't been in Boston at that time, with those cluster of cases occurring, of a very, very, very rare tumor, we might have never found this out. It would have not been so obvious if it, wasn't that the, if it weren't for the fact that these cases were rare, that they occurred in young women, and that this drug was widely used in the Boston area. So chance favors the prepared mind, and many of us have heard the story about the elevator conversation that you had with the mother of one of your young patients. Uh, is that actually how you, you got the information about the DES? <laughs> no, as I mentioned before, the, there was, at least there was no elevator conversation that I remember. Um, the, one of the variations of the elevator story had to do with David Postcancer, whose office was a few floors above mine in what was then called the Vincent Burnham Building, but it had nothing to do with elevators. As I mentioned before, I contacted David because I knew him as an epidemiologist from medical school and I got some statistical advice from Ted Colton, and that's how we put the project together. The mothers uh, of the daughters did provide the first clue to cause us to look into this, so from that point of view, uh, that was extraordinarily important. Okay. Um, what was your first reaction to the idea that something that was prescribed while the, the proban was in utero decades earlier might cause a, a tumor 20 years later? Well, given our state of knowledge at that time, uh, I guess my first reaction was one of surprise, also one of relief in terms of the fact that as best we could determine, uh, DES was given to a large number of women, and there were very, very, very few cases of cancer. So even in the original paper that we published in the New England Journal, we speculated that these cancers would be very rare among the exposed, and uh, that has turned out to be true. Uh, as far as mechanism of concern was concerned, of course, we didn't know. And in fact, in the first paper, we described this as an association. We never said DES caused it. We said it was one of the factors and that we were reasonably sure there had to be other factors which would have to come together to cause the cancer to develop, although we didn't know what those factors were. What was the initial response from the medical community at the meeting where you presented your findings or after the publication? Well, there were a number of interesting responses. Um, one of the facts I didn't mention in the history here is that we published it, as I said, in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
The editor of the journal at that time was Franz Inglefinger, and they had a very strict rule. You don't talk about your paper until it's published. And if you do talk about it before it's published, he would pull it out because he didn't want to see journal articles published in the press before they actually came out in the journal. So I was very nervous about not talking to anybody about this. And I was sitting in my office one day, and I got a call from a fellow by the name of Daniel Shore, who you may have heard of. And my heart sank, because this was about a week before the paper was due out. And I thought, how did he find out about this? So I picked up the phone. It turns out his daughter was a student in Boston, and he wanted me to see her as a patient, which I said I was very happy to do. But it had nothing to do, <laughs> to do with the paper that was coming out uh, in the New England Journal. Uh, a number of my colleagues were very angry. Uh, they were angry that I didn't call them and tell them about it, because of course, as soon as this came out in the New England Journal, it was all over the news and in the media and on television. Uh, and I'm not sure they were very sympathetic to the fact that I wasn't able to tell them. Uh, some doctors were also angry at me because they had given the drug and felt I was causing them a big problem by having to talk to their patients about it. So I'd say there was a mixture of anger, uh, unhappiness obviously on the part of the mothers who took the drug, a fair amount of guilt, and uh, often a very emotional situation. After the publication, were, uh, you made aware of other cases in other cities? Yes, and the Free Hospital for Women, the Fearing Lab, is where doctors George and Olive Smith had worked who started this. Uh, I did break the rules of the New England Journal of Medicine and took to them our paper before it was published so that they would have a chance to read it and know about it. And they, of course, were quite upset about it. The other difficult thing about this is they were also very close personal friends. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, was one of my mentors. Uh, Olive Smith was a very close friend. And as a matter of fact, they were sort of surrogate grandparents to our children. And I, the other day, was going through some old papers. And in 1976, when we, I moved to Chicago to take the chair at the University of Chicago, I got this birthday greeting from them dated September 9, 1976. Dear beloved, we are missing you already. It was good of Pixie, that's our daughter, and Thur, our son, to telephone on June 15th, and of Lee and Art to call on June 27th to say goodbye. So what impact, in retrospect, did the DES paper have on your career? Well, the DES paper changed my life and changed my career, definitely. Uh, I knew it was going to have some effect, the weekend before it came out, my wife and I went up into the country and I said, we better take a nice long weekend together because it's not going to be this relaxing after next weekend. And it wasn't. Uh, there were numerous interviews on television, on radio. Uh, I got calls from all over the place. I was impressed with a number of the reporters, though. One fellow in particular from Associated Press who called, who really spent a fair amount of time on the phone because he wanted to understand what was going on and make sure that he didn't sensationalize the story. And I very much appreciated that. I thought that was quite good. And after that, I was called in front of Congress to testify about DES. And then I was called around various places in the country to give talks and obviously wrote a lot of papers. Now, it turns out that after the New England Journal of Medicine paper was published, uh, Olive Smith went back to the Fearing Lab, got out all their research papers and note cards of the people who had taken DES and gave them to me and said, you've got to follow these women and see what's wrong with them. So our major paper that was published three years later, or four years later, in the, again in the New England Journal of Medicine on uh, the uh, DES and Association of Stilbestrol Therapy uh, and uh, the treatment in young women, uh, which came out in uh, 1975, prenatal exposure to DES, a prospective comparison of exposed female offspring with unexposed controls. The importance of this paper, among other things, is that it related the time in pregnancy the DES was started with the appearance of adenosis in the vagina, which was a very tight link, and uh, at the uh, bottom of this, 
we, uh, we said that we were particularly grateful to doctors Olive and George Smith to provide us a accurate research records of the 841 women who were treated in the DS clinic at the Boston Lion Hospital. How was the initial research funded? Uh, was funded in part through the Vincent Memorial Hospital and the way a lot of things are funded at Harvard, which is through extra work, and that was about the funding. Uh, but uh, we did get some funds from the Vincent Memorial Hospital to carry out the expenses of the first study and from the Mass Division of the American Cancer Society. The subsequent studies were funded by the National Cancer Institute. So how difficult um, do you think it was for mothers of DES exposed daughters to learn that a drug that they took during pregnancy was causing a problem in their daughters? I think it was very difficult. Um, I mean, it was difficult and difficult in an unfair way. Uh, these women were given the drug in good faith uh, by people who believed it would help them. They took it because they wanted to have a baby and then they find out 15, 20, 25 years later that there's this terrible thing that might have happened and uh, I would say the feeling of guilt that they felt was really terrible. Uh, a number of the mothers didn't want to tell their daughters uh, but I sort of felt they had to tell their daughters because it was their daughter's history and they had to know it. So those were tense conversations very often. So your study has been referred to as a signal study in medicine. Um, the DES finding changed the way women and doctors thought about fetal exposure. Um, did you think it would have such long-term ramifications? Well, I didn't know that it would. I think it has, and I think it, along with other studies, has taught us that medicines have risks and they have benefits. So don't take it unless you're reasonably comfortable the benefit will outweigh the risk. Do you think this is one of the first studies to show a uh, development timing uh, factor in uh, teratogen? Yes, the, the other one at the time that was very famous, of course, was thalidomide that came out a few years before this. But this was the first one in humans, to the best of my knowledge, that was linked to a malignancy. Did you anticipate that the DES findings would lead to evaluation of which chemicals would or would not cross the placenta during pregnancy? Yes, but clearly DES did, and a lot of others do as well, as we know. Okay. Um, what do you think were your biggest obstacles in conducting the research? Well, actually, at the time, uh, I suppose time was a bit of an obstacle, and conducting it in a way that was, we were sure that we were doing an honest case control study and not a study where we were trying to show that the DES was the issue. We really fun to find out what other issues there might be. Uh, I think that was difficult, and I think writing the paper, uh, the initial paper that came out in the New England Journal, in clear language that didn't result in it claiming more than there is. In other words, calling it an association uh, indicating that it appeared, which it did, that the tumors were rare, and not trying to make it uh, perhaps worse than it was. What have we learned about DES exposure in the past 40 years? Well, there are a whole number of studies, some of which are still going on, follow-up of the mothers, the daughters, the sons, and even now looking at the third generation of the grandchildren. In the daughters, there have been a number of abnormalities related to anatomic deformities of the genital tract, the uterus, the cervix, and vagina, and so forth. And they have been associated with difficulty getting pregnant and difficulties in holding on to pregnancies, premature birth, ectopic pregnancy. Most of the DES exposed daughters at this point are beyond the childbearing age. So the other things that are important uh, are the fact that they seem to have a slight increased risk of breast cancer, so they do have to have normal, careful breast cancer screening guidelines. And we are looking at other issues, such as are there immunologic problems, and obviously there are emotional issues that come up. Uh, issues of being able to get health insurance sometimes is a, is a big issue. Uh, there is this large multi-center study funded by the National Cancer Institute, which as I said before is still ongoing, 
and uh, we are looking to see if there's a difference between the DES exposed daughters and the controls. In fact, one of these studies is going on here at the Chicago Lion Hospital. We also look at the sons, and although, although there's been a lot written on them, there really is nothing very conclusive at this point, certainly as far as malignancy is concerned. There is a suggestion of maldescent of the testes in some studies. There have been other studies that have suggested difficulties in fathering children, but other studies have said that's not true. So the findings in the sons are a little more murky. In the mothers, there's a definite increased risk of breast cancer, but of course the mothers are much older now and many of them have passed away. And in the grandchildren so far, there's nothing clear cut to indicate abnormalities, at least that we've been able to discover. So how do you think the lessons of DES um, translate to the practice of medicine today or to the training of our new physicians? Well, I think one of the lessons I learned and I hopefully tried to teach the residents that I was teaching when I was active in medicine is that don't give a medicine unless you know what you're doing and don't give it unless you know the risks and the benefits. So I'm not a big believer in adjuvant treatment very often. I think for certain instances, prophylactic antibiotics, for example, have shown to be useful. When used too often and used in cooperation with other things, they can lead to very bad complications. So that can end to be a problem. We learned years ago when women had ovarian cancer, they were given adjuvant alkylating agents when they had early ovarian cancer. It's not clear that their survival was helped. It is clear that years later they were at risk for the development of leukemia. So I think the lesson is be very conservative and cautious before you jump into something new and therapeutic. Is there any ongoing molecular research on the uh, DES phenomenon? There are some. I'm not familiar with all of them. Uh, we do keep a tissue bank here at the University of Chicago and make those tissues available for people who submit a protocol and have their protocol approved by the National Cancer Institute. And I can't give you any results of those because I don't have them on the tip of my tongue. Okay. Um, so DES advocacy groups and, and other disease advocacy groups have changed the way consumers and doctors and scientists interact about disease. Uh, do you feel the DES consumer groups um, uh, affected uh, the way you were able to do your research? Yes, I think they've been very helpful in, in two ways. Um, for the clear cell cases, they've been extremely helpful in our getting cases for the registry we have that has allowed us to learn a lot about the clear cell cancer, its natural history, the pathology, the treatment, the recurrences, and all those kinds of things. Uh, so that's been very helpful. I think they've also been effective in um, lobbying Congress to support this research. And as you know, we're still funded today, along with a number of other centers through the National Cancer Institute. And I rather doubt that we would be if it weren't for that. Um, so what advice would you give to a young person embarking on a career in gynecologic oncology? Gynecologic oncology is a unique opportunity to help a lot of people. We can cure more people today than we could when I started, but unfortunately there's still a lot of people we can't cure. So I think if you enjoy having a combination of surgical therapy and medical therapy, if you're willing to work long hours, which is part of it, and willing to try to help people get better, but also help them if they can't get better, I think it's a career anybody with that mindset could enjoy. So the Deakman study was done here at the University of Chicago, and it was done uh, by one of my predecessors, William Deakman. It was in the 1950s, and it was probably the first double-blind case control medical study ever done. And what he did is he gave DES or a placebo to women who came to the pregnancy clinic here at the prenatal clinic here at Chicago Lying In. And he gave the women who took DES, obviously the DES, but the other women got pills that had a dye marker in them, so he knew they were taking the pill. So from that point of view, it was very well designed, and it showed no effect. 
Uh, the people in Boston felt it wasn't exactly the same thing that they had done because he had given it randomized to women who were normal, whereas the Boston people had given it only to people who had problems. There was actually a study put out from the National Academy of Sciences on drug efficacy that I think was in the 1960s, if I remember correctly, looking at drugs to help abnormal pregnancies. And DES was in that study, and that it could either be ineffective, possibly effective, probably effective, or effective. And DES at that time was listed as possibly effective, and that is after the Diekman study had been published. So from the, the follow-up study that used the lying-in cases, what, mm -hmm. what did you estimate at that time would be the risk of an exposed daughter developing cancer? We thought it would be less than one in a thousand, and the Mayo Clinic came out with an epidemiologic estimate that it would be between 0.14 and 1.4 per thousand. So one per thousand to one to 10,000. That's probably about accurate, even today and the, the risk of adenosis in the first step. Well, adenosis is dependent on a couple things. One, not only when the drug was started during pregnancy, but there's some evidence that adenosis heals by a process that you're familiar with called squamous metaplasia, so that you don't see it as frequently in older women who may have had it when they were younger. It just tends to heal and go away most of the time. Why did I come to the University of Chicago? Because I was offered the chairmanship of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I thought that would be a wonderful academic uh, challenge and uh, something that I wanted to try to do and see what I could do to build a department and train residents. So I came. How many years were you chair? I was chair from 1976 to 2001. 25? Almost 24, 24 probably, yeah. What do you think was your greatest accomplishment as chair? I survived that long. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. He also recruited me. That was probably my greatest thing. The, the story of how I got recruited, I understood, was that you told pathology that they could hire the new gynae pathologist, but they had to be somebody trained in Boston. Yeah. And they called Mass General, and Dwayne Lawrence had already taken a job at Hutzel. And so then they called the Brigham and they said, yeah, we've got this guy. And so out of the blue, I got a phone call asking me to come interview here. I mean, I, I hadn't applied for a job in Chicago. It was good for us and good for you. Oh, it was good. Worked out well. Yeah, so the, the question is, is research like this more difficult to do today because of so-called HIPAA laws and the IRB? And the answer is definitely yes. There's no question about it. I um, was a young teenager, kind of as most young teenagers are, kind of dealing with my sexuality and I had this awful discharge, like a vaginal discharge and I was a swimmer. I was a very competitive, serious swimmer and doctors were discounting it and saying it's because you're wet all the time and that's what's causing your vaginitis, this is totally fine, it's totally normal, there's nothing wrong. And so we went from doctor to doctor, trying to figure that out. Finally, I, as I was getting ready to graduate from college, a doctor did look at me and said, you have two polyps, vaginal polyps. They're nothing. Don't worry about them. And that made me worry. I had two malignant tumors. I was 21 years old. I had just graduated from college. I had a 10 and a half hour surgery. They removed basically everything. Um, removed my vagina, reconstructed my vagina with my colon. I was in the hospital a month. I was 21 years old. DES has wreaked havoc on my life, on my body, but um, you know, I'm here to complain about it, which is really <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> I go about my life as if nothing ever happened to me, like I'm fine. But I, you know, I, I have a good life because of Dr. Herbst. And I've been one of the lucky ones. I have had good care. And um, again, I'm so, I'm grateful.